Hello and welcome back to the channel. LC here today, back with part three of our Telly's retrospective series. And today is the day that we talk about the absolute insanity that is Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn. I had a chance to go back and replay this game one day after I did Path of Radiant. So this all took place about three weeks ago. And honestly, man, this game is just insane <laughs> in so many ways. So that I thought that was a fitting title for this. We'll be doing a bit of a general overview about the things that I liked about the game and the things that I definitely think could have been handled differently and kind of focusing on the key question. Is this a worthy successor to Path of Radiance? Path of Radiance definitely has a very like strong feeling for a lot of us that, you know, this was a lot of people's first Fire Emblem game. And we look back on it very fondly and I consider it a masterpiece. So does it live up to that? And if not, what are the things that could have been changed, right? As usual, if you are new here, please make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and let me know your experience with Radiant Dawn, if you've ever played it, what you thought about the difficulty and kind of your thoughts and senses on where it falls within the entire hierarchy of Fire Emblem games. But without further ado, let's jump into it. Part three of our Telly's retrospective series, Radiant Dawn is insane. After replaying through both titles in the Telly series over the last month, I was left with a host of sentiments regarding my feelings for both entries in the series. You see, while my playthrough of Path of Radiance was an enjoyable retread into the halls of yesteryear, why I gotta be the black guy that speaks like this? and I found myself effortlessly absorbed back into the rich and captivating world whilst watching the development of young Ike go from would-be mercenary to the leader of the Crimean Liberation Forces. It reinforced my initial feelings that Path of Radiance is a surefire masterpiece. I completed that game with a great deal of fulfillment and appreciation for the entirety of the journey, but that soon faded and I was left with a measured amount of trepidation knowing what awaited me behind the next door in the Telia series. Now I've played Radiant Dawn before about 10 to 11 years ago, and I always had a bevy of mixed opinions regarding the totality of this package. From the story, character development, narrative structure, I've always had a bit of a love-hate dynamic when it came to this title. And it starts with just some of the little things. For every upgrade that they make in this game, it seems like they take an equal measure step back. Like, look at this narration for this event. A great war begins, one that threatens to tear the land asunder. A hero sides with the Lagoons and Justice. The Maiden of Dawn fights for the Bjork and Dayan. This just kind of gives me like anime vibes, like showing you what's going next. This always felt so weird. I don't know why this is here. This gives you like real PowerPoint presentation vibes. I'm like, why? Why is this guy telling us what's coming up next? That's supposed to be part of the surprise, right? I, it almost felt like they needed to tell us that something else was going to happen to keep our attention and keep people playing. This is always so weird. And you know what? Back in the day, I could never really put my finger on exactly what made me hold Radiant Dawn in such a lower prestige than Path of Radiance. I mean, there's some very obvious callouts here, right? The pacing and structure of the plot and its delivery, some of the characters themselves, and the big one for most people, the difficulty is an absolute menace. I mean, some real masochistic shit, but don't worry, we'll get into that later. To be fair, it's never an easy task to follow up a beloved title and not only expound on the world and thematic structures that were presented in the original title, but somehow build an equally compelling character arc for newly introduced protagonists and antagonists alike. This is something I touched on previously in my Suikoden 2 retrospective about what makes this a good sequel. But before we turn this into a full-blown rant about things I didn't like about Radiant Dawn, I would say that this game does have a decent amount of enjoyment. Whether or not you played the previous title, this as a standalone game does have a decent amount of enjoyment to be had. Things such as updated models, a smarter skill system, and more creative stage design make the actual gameplay of Radiant Dawn an improvement over its predecessor mechanically in almost every conceivable way. Also of note, I would say that the world and lore building for the land of Tellius is very rich throughout, including the new Laguz tribes that are introduced, magical concepts such as the Branded and Blood Packs, and much deeper and further exploration into the goddess Ashera and the truth behind the Fire Emblem. So there's more than enough narrative-wise to keep people invested as the story unfolds. Okay, so let's start with talking about all the things that Radiant Dawn got right, the things I liked. Starting with, the evolution of certain characters over the time gap and throughout Radiant Dawn, certain characters such as Micaiah, Sanaki, Alencia, Jill, and the Bird Tribes are all standouts as the most compelling cast members throughout the game's playtime, and Queen Alencia in particular delivers one of the most moving moments in character growth throughout the entirety of both games. You see, one of my major issues that I have with her in Path Radiance is that she had zero agency. She was just pretty much a permanent damsel in distress, and I, I can't think of anything worse than that. But in this game, she is a full-blown unit, and she's one of my favorite units as well to use. But they actually show the growing pains of, you know, managing, controlling a whole country. So Queen Alencia, one of the best characters in this game for sure. The bird tribes, the herons, the hawks, and the ravens all universally have pretty excellent uh, character arcs and I like where they end up from the beginning to the end. I like the whole blood pack thing went in the solid. That's all handled pretty well. I love that. Actually, speaking of that, I found the entire plot device of the blood pack to be pretty well handled 
and it does an exceptional job at forcing encounters we otherwise wouldn't be able to see and giving said parties, uh, you know, not an uh, easy out. They can't just walk away from this. They have to fight because, you know, the blood pack. I love that element as well within Radiant Dawn. One thing that I really liked was definitely the continued evolution of Raisin and Leanne's character arc. And introducing Raphael as kind of the actual, like, traditional Heron and seeing the dichotomy between those, I actually thought was pretty cool as well. And then just kind of seeing Raisin's complete character arc and his, you know, how strong he's grown. Pretty good. Loved it. So the final thing when it comes to characters I really like was Makai and Sanaki, specifically those two together. I like the, the their entire arc, the fact that they're actually sisters and she's actually the apostle. Uh, she can hear the voice of the goddess and everything like that. And Sanaki's not. And, you know, that entire thing kind of saved Makai's uh, character arc for me. I really didn't like the whole Yune uh, twist where, you know, all of a sudden Yune has been there the whole time. And she's the one that's, you know, been giving her the force thoughts and stuff like that. I really wish that they would have just made Yune her own character. She comes out of the Fire Emblem, she's just like a physical being. The fact that she has to kind of like possess Makai is kind of whack. I didn't like that. And then to even make it, the other thing that kind of rubbed me the wrong way with that is that if an actual god has been there with you the entire time, you know what I mean? Why are you so fucking weak? You know what I mean? She's one of the worst characters in the game. If you're going to be like having a god and having your body, like let's have some stats to like pump this up. And I'll touch on her stats and everything like that in the next section when we talk about battles and stuff like that. But that is just one thing I just didn't, I couldn't get behind that. Could not dig that. So let's talk about the difficulty in Radiant Dawn. It seems to almost be at complete odds with itself. The developers seem to justify the difficulty of this title by giving you several extremely strong and abusable units throughout the game. Units like Nephany, Mia, and the one and only God Mode Har. This man is essentially Affinity War Thor in this game and is an absolute broken mess. And unlike Path of Radiance, which also had some very strong and abused with units, the wealth is not equally distributed throughout the rest of the cast. And even if you make an effort to field certain units and dump a lot of bonus EXP into them, some units will actually never be more than just okay. It's a real shame and seemingly kind of a bit of a step back when it comes to overall character diversity. And in closing, this game's themes are much more profound and existential than its predecessor, asking the player to think critically and frequently regarding religion, belief systems, and generational traditions. I think the most poignant of these themes explored is does man have a genuine need for a god? And if there can ever be peace in a land of such diversity and dissenting mindsets and worldviews. Unfortunately, this more ambitious and grandiose narrative comes at the direct cost of more intimate character development that we saw in the previous title. And that does it for everything that I really dug about this game and the things that really stand out to me. So let's talk about things that didn't work for me. Yes, this part will be longer. So let's kick this off talking about the game's narrative pacing and structure. Now, I've gone on record multiple times stating that titles that have multiple POVs that converge into one main chapter typically never work out very well tone-wise. This has been true in my previous experience of games like Final Fantasy IV The After Years and Suikoden III. There's just something so jarring at times when you go from a celebration or a victory or a crescendo of a character arc just to begin again at absolute ground zero at a different POV. And it's arguably even more punishing gameplay wise due to Radiant Dawn's difficulty level and to go from an absolutely jacked up character POV to a different POV that has extremely suspect units with real issues with survivability. It creates this very shifting tonal dichotomy that really makes you dread seeing this fucking screen. And with that, we've arrived at what is seemingly one of most players issues with this game, the Dawn Brigade. While starting off with a pretty basic premise of a scrappy upstart trying to overthrow the corrupt Benyon occupying force, everything promising about this premise quickly falls flat. To start with, this section is entirely too long without providing nearly enough world or character development to justify its extremely long runtime. Throughout this section, you're saddled with some of the worst units to grace the Telia series, and apart from that, the entire narrative that unfolds here is pretty vanilla. You know what I mean? We've seen this before. You know, they, they take back their country and everything like that. The issue is, is that there's so much time spent on side characters like Peleus, which is one of the most useless characters ever. And then his very infuriating retainers, his mother and Azuka are just like the, the most infuriating characters of all time. And you spend so much time, you know, watching this and some of the character arcs do pay off. You know, Peleus does and his mother Almeida's does, but like there's just so much time spent with it and it just seems to drag on. This entire section takes entirely too long. And when it comes to units to start with, outside of Big Dog Nolan, now seriously, let's clap a little for Nolan. That's the homie right there. Outside of Nolan, I really think that most of the units that you have in the Dawn Brigade are pretty bad. You know what I mean? You do eventually get access to other characters, especially if you did Path Radiance data transfer over. You can get like really good stats like Jill, Z Hark, uh, Terrenio, stuff like that. That's all good. The base characters that you have for the Dawn Brigade are just ass. 
and no other character encapsulates this more than our hollowed Priestess of the Dawn, Micaiah. Now, typically, I'm not overly fond with having a mage as my main character in any strategy RPGs, as they're typically prone to very low defense, and it can be one shot in most cases, right? They need to be protected at all times. They need a bodyguard. She takes one hit, even from basic units, she's out of there, bro. So enter Micaiah. This character is a never ending box of disappointment on the battlefield from the first chapter into the very end. And even when giving an extra generous portion of bonus EXP, I'm talking about double and triple servings, you know what I mean? That plate was thick, we, we, we piled it up. She still won't double anything, you know what I mean? Like for 99.99% .99 of this game, she's just an empty character slot. She's just a liability, and I don't like having that, especially as a unit that is your main character. This is whack. Some of these uh, battles that they set you up in, it's, it seems really quite insane. <laughs> now, just a disclaimer, I know that the whole situation with, you know, the translation where the difficulty, you know, you're playing in normal, you're actually playing in hard mode. So I get that, you know what I mean? I know I was technically playing in hard mode. I played this game before, but some of the maps, I just swear to God, they're just way too, it's way too easy to lose a unit. You know what I mean? Like you're positioning needs to be pristine your decision making needs to be pristine and stuff like that and they could just flat out just lose a unit you know what i mean and if you're going for a deathless run like i am uh you're going to see a lot of this screen here you know a lot of restarting and stuff like that so it creates this really strange like paradox where you need to fill these units in order for them to get better but they could die so fucking easily and then moving on to my other issue with radiant dawn ike now ike his character arc in Path of Radiance, I love. It's one of my favorite character arcs in any game, strategy RPG or not. It's just really, really well done. And in this game, he doesn't really have a character arc. Or rather, he does the same character arc kind of beat by beat exactly again. Maybe it's because I just finished my Path of Radiance playthrough a day before I began this title. But every single time I play through this game, I am always disappointed by Ike's arc throughout this entire title. The issue here is that he really doesn't have one or it's literally the one he just did three years ago. He allies himself with a faction against an overwhelming adversary, in this case, Benyon. Eventually, he becomes a Supreme Commander and fights the Black Knight again to surpass his father. That fight, by the way, is a joke. Bro, why can't I just two-shot this man with the hammer? Not blessed, by the way. I thought you said previously that only blessed weapons could hit you. What's going on, man? What's the truth? I kind of just becomes a Tellius version of Ryu, headband and all, a very vanilla character. Most of the personality traits and quips that he had in the previous title are toned down significantly due to the shared screen time between the different POVs. I understand he's older and more mature and stuff like that, but it seems like his entire personality has just dwindled down to being just the leader. It's just so vanilla and I just don't like that. Now, while this moment was genuinely kick-ass the first time I saw it, like genuinely, I was like, that's fucking sick. I love that. I really think that the Black Knight's character arc was completed in Path Radiance and his appearance here feels 100% like fan service. I think either separating the characters of Zelgius and the Black Knight and giving Ike a completely different main antagonist would have worked better. Every single time I replay his arc in this game, I'm left 100% disappointed. I don't know if this is just me. Let me know down in the comments, but I really don't like Ike's arc in Radiant Dawn at all. And moving on to my final two gripes when it comes to Radiant Dawn. We have to talk about part four. Now, when you reach this chapter, it really feels like the programmers just took an eight ball and just literally just start doing crazy stuff. The volume of units that you have to encounter here is ridiculous. It seems like they kind of did this as kind of a last ditch effort to make sure all your units were, you know, as high level or they gave you the access to level up as many units as you wanted to before you reach the tower, which makes sense. Now I get and understand why this has to happen. However, the issue here is that it's handled in the most insane manner of all times with legions upon legions of reinforcements. Now, this isn't anything new for Fire Emblem or strategy games in general. A good crop of reinforcements throughout a playthrough can help keep you on your toes and keep the matchup intriguing throughout, right? See a little bit of reinforcements come through, you know, you got to kind of switch up your strategy, you got to reposition, that's all good. However, there's a thin line between challenging the player and completely unhinged behavior, and the developers are firmly in the latter camp for this title. You thought you were moving to the next section? Nope, get fucked. Reinforce, baby. You left some weaker units back at the starting points? Reinforce, baby. Oh, you need to save these weaker units so they don't die? Get fucked. Reinforced, baby. And then for the second thing, to top it all off, when you actually get to the tower, the game hilariously gives you f like five uber broken characters. You know what I mean? It's like you went through this entire game and you spent all this time like upgrading your units. You really like them and everything like that. Then the game just kind of says, fuck off. You know what I mean? They just give you these extremely boosted units. And it's kind of like, why wouldn't you use them? You know, Kanegas is extremely strong. Gifka, stuff like that. 
Why wouldn't you use these units, especially units like Nyla, Tibarn, Nassal is not that great, actually. Why would you not use them? It's kind of like, I'm sorry, pal. Gatry, our friendship's concluded. Negus is my bestie now. So to wrap it up, when it comes to Radiant Dawn, I still have very, very mixed feelings. I don't hate this game, but it's not a game that I ever really want to go back and actually play. I think if I tried it on just like easy, which I guess is normal difficulty, I might like it more, but I don't think so. Uh, main reason is that even though the difficulty is batshit, you see, the thing is that players will endure a higher difficulty if the reward is like in the payoff is just that much more satisfying. That's fine, but I don't think the story here is really as satisfying. I never feel satisfied when I beat this game. And it's just because I didn't like what they did with Ike's arc. And I really never felt much of a connection with Makaya. I never did. I didn't really like her until like the third chapter. Uh, this part of that is, has to do with her not being a good unit. And just like the whole God unit thing. I just didn't like, there's too many things I didn't like about her. Like the characters I really like liked in this game, honestly. Uh, whereas Alencia is probably one of my, my favorite characters. And I like the Bird Tribe's entire arc. But there's just some things that just don't work. Like I didn't like Skrimir. There's a lot of like fucking characters in this game that just are whack. You know what I mean? They're just really annoying, and I just don't want to actually interact with them, if that makes sense. You know, think, oh, I'm going to replay Radiant Dawn, but then you think, Peleus, Izuka, Almeida, you know what I mean? Like, all these things come to your head, and you say, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to fucking, like, subject myself to that again. It just really, really hurts the replayability of it. Even though they do do a pretty good job of expanding the entire world, it's not a title I would replay again, and I don't think it's a masterpiece. I think it's definitely... Uh, at least a notch underneath uh, Path of Radiance for sure. So, and that's pretty much my thoughts on Radiant Dawn. If you like this title, let me know what you like about it down in the comments below. Uh, make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you want to see next from the Fire Emblem series. But other than that, LC signing out. Peace.